All right. Um, so for for uh, some of the people that are um, on either the Facebook or the Instagram, uh, you know that we had to uh, re-record this for audio issues. Um, with that being said, though, uh, just going to restart the interview. Uh, Gene, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, my name is Gene Arkhipov, uh, or Eugene Arkhipov. Uh, I'm the president of Russia Lacrosse, uh, captain of the Russian national team, uh, alumni of RIT and uh, Cumberland Valley High School in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, and um, I, I developed lacrosse in Russia. Great, great. Um, so uh, if, if you'd like to tell us um, what your first lacrosse experience was, um, you know, how did you choose the sport? Um, you know, with the wide variety of everything that's else that's out there. Sure. Uh, I emigrated to the United States uh, when I was six years old with my mother. Uh, my aunt was already here, and uh, the only sport I really knew was soccer. So when I came uh, to the United States, we, my mom pushed me to a lot of different sports, and obviously soccer was natural for me to get pushed into because she there was already familiar familiarity. Uh, then I started playing basketball, uh, and that that was also very fun for me. I played in, you know, uh, in school and whatnot. And uh, and then in fifth grade, my uh, my cousin who uh, played, who's uh, how many years older? He's about I think I think like seven or eight years older than me. Uh, but anyway, he was in high school at that time, and he was playing lacrosse. I was in fifth grade, um, and um, I remember we were in the garage of my aunt's house and he gave me a stick and he told me just, just do this with the stick, just cradle it. And I don't know why I did it. I, I just did it. And I did it with my left hand, right hand. I mean, it seemed like a cool thing to do. Uh, he told me to do it and worked out. And I was waiting for the next, you know, the, <clears throat> the next task and it never came. But that was actually my first experience with lacrosse. Uh, and then after that, um, I actually attended a private school called the Harrisburg Academy. Uh, they had lacrosse uh, uh, earlier, a couple decades ago or a decade ago, uh, and now it's uh, Trinity High School with Harrisburg Academy mix, uh, private schools, and they have one team. Uh, but before, I used to go there, and that was uh, lacrosse and tennis were the only choices in the spring because I played soccer and basketball, and lacrosse and tennis were the only choices. And I'm not a tennis guy, so to speak. I respect the sport, but um, if I had to choose, of course, uh, I would rather do something other than, uh, tennis. Plus all the guys were pushing me to play lacrosse. They said, you know, Hey, you're fast, man. You can, you can really help us out on the field. I didn't know what they were talking about, but in hindsight, they were correct. Um, lacrosse was a, a much better pick for me than, uh, tennis, uh, would have been, I think I'm pretty sure. Uh, so that was that was really my first experience with lacrosse. Uh, I started playing, and I, I started loving it. Sweet, sweet. Um, go, go ahead and tell me a little bit about uh, the Russian lacrosse organization, what you're trying to build, what you've already accomplished, uh, stuff like that. Uh, well, let's begin with uh, what we've accomplished and where, where it started, where it is now, and what I'm trying to build. Um, so it started with just, uh, I came to Russia in 2010. I Googled, uh, I, I was coming to Russia on a, just a vacation. It was first time in 18 years. My aunt pushed me to come and visit. And I Googled Moscow lacrosse and somebody was here doing it. There's one guy that was throwing around at a park, David Diamanon, uh, with a, a couple of people. And um, it was just for fun, you know, just, just throwing around in the park. And that's, that's all we needed. And I, I came and, uh, and that's how it started. I came and I wanted to do a little, uh, a little bit more work with it. I wanted to have more of a team, a, a serious team, and and uh, not just throwing around in the park. That's also uh, useful, but we wanted to be a little more competitive, a little bit more serious. Uh, as you can imagine, just finishing up NCAA competition, I, you know, it stops, and then all of a sudden. Uh, you, you think like, what am I going to do next? Well, I wanted to keep playing somehow. I wanted to play in Europe in different competitions and I wanted to make sure I'm staying in shape and maybe I could bring someone with me. And there's, there was already a base here. So we decided to work on that uh, and build upon that. Um, then obviously we, we grew, grew. Uh, we had, 
we we had a, a Moscow and a St. Pete team. Uh, barely, we could call it a team in, in, in either place. And um, we started to develop there in, in both places. Uh, then we had children's sections and it started to grow like uh, like little mushrooms everywhere, you know, like a couple people here, this uh, cute children's uh, group growing, the adults growing, this town growing, this city growing. We have a city out in the middle of Siberia uh, where we have Krasnoyarsk, where we have people playing lacrosse, you know, and they came, they came over to my apartment. They learned, they stayed at my place for a couple of days. We went outside and practiced for four hours a day. I taught them the game. And, and, and that's what I did for about, uh, about 10 years, I would say. Uh, David, the guy that founded lacrosse, was a, or the first lacrosse uh, player, I guess we could say, that, that did anything in Moscow, he left. Uh, he was here on a, on a work. Uh, he's an expat, so he was working here. Uh, he left, and he left it in our hands. And we took it through the stratosphere. You know, now, if we started with just you know, five, seven guys thrown in a park, now we have uh, two uh, championship teams. What I mean by that is like the higher level of lacrosse in Russia. We have two high level teams. We have two uh, lower level teams. And then of course we have uh, children's teams and all that. We have a uh, national team uh, of Americans and Russian. Uh, we have uh, a travel team uh, that goes uh, around Europe mostly, the Hero City All-Stars. And that's an international travel team that I created that gives opportunities for Russians to play abroad as well as friends that, you know, I played, I played in Europe for many, many years and 10 years and a lot of different tournaments. And I know a lot of people and friends and I like to play with them and I invite them to play. And I, you know, I always thought it would be cool to play with your friends and uh, lo and behold, it is cool. So, you know, it was fun to bring different cultures, different people, different backgrounds together. And now we, uh, we're on the next level, you know, where we have uh, coaches seminars, we have referee seminars, we're opening up another children's, uh, or, um, uh, children's team. Uh, we opened up a fund, uh, a nonprofit fund in, in, in Russia, uh, I'm sorry, in the United States for uh, Russian Americans that play. So we're doing, we're doing things in a lot of different, uh, in a lot of different directions. Uh, we're trying to grow grassroots here. We're trying to develop here in different directions as well, the serious and non-serious direction. Uh, and, uh, of course, abroad. We're, you know, there's a lot of Russians living abroad, so we always have to try to find people abroad. And, and that's, that's where we are right now. We, we've been to our first championship was the 2014 World Championship in Denver, and our last one was was going to be, or the most recent one was going to be, uh, 2020 in Poland, but that got pushed back. So we're moving forward. Uh, we're growing. And the goals, I guess, uh, the goals really would be, there's a lot of different goals, like internally and externally. Internally, what I mean is there's a lot of bureaucratic things that go on in Russia. Like you need to have this document or that document. Lacrosse isn't even considered a sport in Russia uh, because you have to have a certain amount of documents and you have to control, like show control that you can control the sport. And it's a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of, um, legal stuff more than it is actually play um and uh, so that's the internal goal is to make russia or uh lacrosse official in russia uh through the ministry of sport and all that and of course uh national team goal is to do as better as best as we can qualify for the worlds uh internally also we want to grow as, as much as we can have more children playing more children getting taught correctly not just the gym teacher uh teaching them how to you know uh, run around but actual tactics of the game skills of the game well, we want to we want to produce lacrosse players uh, not just people that are getting together uh, just to throw around you know we want to make sure we have at least some contingency of serious lacrosse players because without that uh, there's there's nobody that's going to follow you know you have to have leaders to lead uh, if you want to if if, if you want to have an organization that grows you got to find a group of people not just one but a group of people that are ready and willing to go forward and put in the work. Otherwise, nobody's going to follow. If everybody's just sitting around waiting for something to happen or just, you know, uh, uh, spinning their wheels, it's not effective. You've got to have at least a group of people that's leading the way, leading the charge, setting an example for everybody else. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get better every day. We're trying to set an example. And uh, my personal goal, and this is something that we've had the opportunity to do for a couple of years now, but 
Um, other people have not taken the offer yet, but my personal goal is to send a Russian kid to America to play in an American school, like an official league and with all, with refs and, you know, all that. Uh, I want them, I want them to feel that because I believe that's the most fun I've ever had in lacrosse, uh, an official organized lacrosse, high school lacrosse, the whole season, the guys, bus trips, you know, ripping on each other on the bus, uh, you have the emotions of the game, travel games, home games. It's uh, it's a different atmosphere, and I think it's one of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences that all lacrosse players uh, should really feel, especially the ones that love lacrosse and have the opportunity to play. So that's my next personal goal and our organization's uh, goal as well, because I think that would be a great a great step uh, for rest of lacrosse. Absolutely. It sounds like uh, you know there's great things ahead um, in your program. Um, so going back to uh, when you mentioned the, uh, you know, bureaucratic difficulty um, and that, that sort of aspect, what would you say was the biggest challenge that you faced, whether that be as a player, a coach, a mentor, you know, a leader? Um, and, and how did you, you know, sort of react to that and uh, use that to become, you know, a better person, a better leader yourself? There's a lot of challenges and uh, there are a lot of, there really is uh, just a plethora of challenges that come your way on from different aspects, you know, from, like I said, in the beginning, maybe it's uh, with registering a nonprofit or um, yeah, not for profit organization, you know, just the legal aspects of getting the documents together to, to get that going. Um, then finding people, how do you recruit people? Uh, I went to the, I went to courts in Russia, basketball courts, and I played basketball, and I <laughs> invited people to come play lacrosse. Uh, that's how it happened, you know. And uh, next challenge is uh, teaching the people that you gathered to play lacrosse, not just to throw around, but to, you know, put the cigarette down and take it a little more seriously, or at least find people that, you know, are taking lacrosse a little bit more serious. Um, and then you get to the point of where you have an organization, a structure, a good group of people, you have practices, you have stability, you have consistency, and now you have to play the political game. And you have to really, uh, you have to really make some difficult decisions. And probably the most difficult decisions we've made or we've had to make is uh, with people. Uh, when we deal with a, when, when you have an organization that deals with people, your people are your greatest asset and your worst nightmare. Uh, because they're, they, they're the things that, or they are what keep you going and motivated. And they are the things that uh, set you back and make you think, man, I don't really want to do this. Why am I doing it for this guy? You know? So uh, I guess the biggest challenge is really from, uh, from a leader's aspect, from the leader's aspect is uh, making difficult decisions. And as we discussed in our uh, previous interview, the one that didn't have a good audio, you know, um, sometimes you have to be the asshole, you know, like you have a certain amount of people coming to practice and one guy's being disruptive, right? And one guy's consistently being disruptive or he's consistently, um, uh, ha he, he's consistently being insubordinate or he's, arguing or yelling or just causing a ruckus, distracting other people, you know, laughing or, or joking around or whenever someone asks him like, Hey, when the coach is talking, please, you know, could you please be quiet? He keeps talking just in general disrespect. Uh, you have to make a decision because other serious players see that and they think like, wow, well, if that can happen here, then this isn't a serious organization. That means any asshole can come in here and just, you know, uh, ruin everybody else's time you know when nine out of ten guys are being serious and listening and trying to go forward and get better and you have one guy messing around that that screws everything up so uh the, the most difficult part really is people it really is um you know you have to you have to make that decision do you let go of that one guy and maybe upset him and his friends but then the plus side of it, you get more people coming to practice because they see that it's, uh, it's more serious, right? Or do you let everybody in and that guy acts a fool? He's, you know, he's the asshole in the at the practice, but you want to keep everybody, right? And 
you you'll keep him and you'll keep him and his friends happy but the peer, people that are serious and the people that are dearest to you lacrosse wise are going to leave because they it's it's not serious anymore it's you know it's a joke people are making a joke out of it or disrespecting it and there's no structure and you know if you if you create an environment for athletes you're going to get athletes right if you create an environment for lacrosse players you're going to get lacrosse players if you get create an environment for party goers you're going to get party goers so sometimes you have to make, you have to draw the line. And unfortunately, sometimes people's feelings get hurt, but for the greater good, it's something you got to do. You know, when you, you want to talk about leadership, Machiavelli, you know, for the greater good, sometimes you have to look like the bad guy just so you can raise the general level of everybody and, and really the organization that's around you because you lose a lot of respect when, you know, you're trying to you're trying to seriously you're trying to work seriously and someone's disrupting and you're not acting towards it you know it's like you're kind of just taking it and taking it it doesn't seem like a serious organization so uh, the biggest problem and the biggest challenge is always people and uh, um, in one way or another so uh, like I said in the other video um, you know if, if it's in, if in the beginning I was trying to t learn from reading books like how to you know, teach lacrosse better or what drills to do. Now I'm reading Art of War and, or rather rereading Art of War and Machiavelli's The Prince just because I want to know how to deal with, or because I want to remember how to deal with these, these people. Um, uh, you know, you have a guy that goes to practice once a year and then he shows up at practice, yells at a bunch of other guys, you know, and, and, he, and he leaves and then he, you know, he, he wants to be on the national team. So it's, it's kind of like, well, why, you know, how, how, these people are putting in the work, you're not putting in the work, but then they get upset. How do you deal with that? You know, how do you tell him like, look, man, like look how many, many times you came to practice and look how many times you, someone else did, came to practice, you know, let's look at it, you know, objectively. So those are the difficulties that, um, because all the paperwork, the logistics and, you know, like for example, early in, earlier in our uh, history we had logis logistics problems you know like just getting stuff to russia uh but that's all easy that'll take care of, that'll that'll find that'll, that you'll always find a way for that kind of stuff but with people that's, that's the most difficult because it's not like just finding a logistical channel or a delivery service or or whatever it is it's uh, you've got to deal with people's emotions and people's thoughts you know guy hasn't even played lacrosse for one year is trying to tell me how to do things. <laughs> it's like, there's a point of where you just say like, stop, you know, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me just do my work. You do, do your job. I do mine. But people get upset, you know, they think they know better. So that's, that's very difficult. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and, you know, going back to your, your, your comment on uh, different people, um, commitment is just a huge, huge thing in, in higher level athletics, you know, and, it's something that's important to you as it should be. It's, it's something that you, you need to have to develop like a, a good, solid, consistent team. You know, it's just that, that commitment, that drive, the passion, um, you know, and not everybody has it. Uh, so that's, that's one of the most important things. Um, so kind of, kind of flipping the switch then, um, going a little on the more bright side. Um, what would you say your uh, pinnacle moment in lacrosse is, your best, your favorite? I know you mentioned earlier, um, you know, those high school trips um, and, you know, playing in high school. Um, but, you know, is there anything that you can think of that you just, you, you put right at the top? Yeah, there's two, two moments in my life. One, um, well, obviously, like I said, the high school trip, that, that's just, that whole time was just incredible. That's just four years of fun, uh, ups and downs, but mostly ups, to be honest with you. You look back on it, yeah, there were some downs, but the ups outweighed the downs all the time because it was serious, but it was still fun. You know, it's, there was an aspect of like, hey, get it together. We're trying to win, but there's also that like, hey, man, you know, we're, it's, you know, no one's going to die at the end of the day. No one's losing any money. You know, it's nothing catastrophic. So that, that was a great time. However, me personally, if we talk, uh, me personally, I would say there was two moments that were the most important for me. Uh, like I said, I immigrated to the United States from Russia. So, uh, and I'll be honest, we, we started really, um, poor, <laughs> just to put it simply, we were poor. Uh, and, uh, I didn't know how I was going to get an education for some reason, you know, maybe it was because of propaganda. People tell me I needed an education, but it was very important to me. I always thought like, Hey, I want to make sure I get a college education. Cause I don't, you know, I, I don't want to end up without one, 
Uh, it's risky out here without one. Um, so I wanted to make sure I could get into college. So, and, and I figured out lacrosse was going to be my engine. Uh, my grades were always good, but lacrosse helped tremendously. Um, so my first moment of like this, uh, like you, you felt like you were really on cloud nine uh, when you got that letter from that college that you want to go to, you know, that says you're accepted, you're smart enough, you're good enough, and people like you, it's all right, you know, come our way. That was the first moment because, you know, you can, you can have your dreams and fantasies, but if that college rejects you because your SATs or your grades or, or whatever, regardless of how, how good you are, we're not even talking about skill yet, all your dreams go down the toilet. You know, you think like, damn, man, I'm going to play for Princeton one day. And you might be good enough to play for Princeton, but that report card, son, <laughs> you know, it's not, not up to par. So I was, that was that moment where I figured out, you know, like I did everything correctly. You know, I might have made some mistakes in high school. You know, I did uh, in my life in general, but I mean, in, in high school also, I made my mistakes. There was a lot of moments where I could have lost it all. But, um, you know, a lot of people had their doubts too, but I proved them wrong, whoever doubted me, and I proved right to people that supported me. So I was really happy about that. Uh, but I'll be honest with you. The second moment is, has to deal with college in college. Uh, that was the next step. That was a big failure for me. Uh, I didn't know how to string a stick. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't ready for that speed of the game yet. Um, I didn't really fit in well with the university. I didn't really like the place. There was some issues with the, uh, the coach at that time. We had 13 freshmen coming in, uh, freshman year. And by senior year, there was two seniors left, 11 kids left. Uh, throughout within four years I was one of those 11 I didn't want to leave but I also had a family situation where my grandfather got sick I transferred to a community college close to my uh, family for a semester then you know everything kind of bounced back and I went back and it was a little bit too much to uh, back and forth back and forth and when I came back it was you know I, I it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a good situation. So I, I decided to actually quit third year. Uh, I think it was February, right before the season. I don't regret quitting, but, uh, I, you know, I might regret where I went to college. I might regret in terms of like socially or whatever. I could have had a, you know, maybe had a better time elsewhere. Um, but I don't regret quitting because at that time it really, um, it really propelled me to the life I have today. Uh, however, I had this big hole in my, uh, I guess my heart, you know, in my, probably my ego more than my heart that, you know, I didn't finish lacrosse. I didn't prove myself out there. Um, uh, and I didn't prove that I can play and compete on that level consistently. So that was always in the back of my head. So when I went to the world championships in 2014, that was a redemption for me because there was a lot of good competition there, a lot of D1, D3 players all playing in one team. You know, they look like New Zealand, but, man, there's a lot of white blonde kids there, you know, like that could speak English with an American accent. So, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying that the competition was good. Uh, and I did well, personally. Um, and it was surprisingly well. I didn't know how it was going to be because it was a big question mark in college. And I did well, uh, relatively, and that was that the second moment of my, it was kind of like a rebirth of my lacrosse career in a sense, because even though I kept playing lacrosse, I never felt, um, it, it was kind of because of the failure, I felt that I didn't do enough. So going to the world where, uh, where I, uh, it was like that second moment of, um bliss so to speak like a redemption and obviously all the championships after that too were uh were also uh partially well i mean the first one was the best obviously because that was like that first knowledge of like man i'm i'm all right man you know i'm good i'm all right you know I'm, i might not be the best player in the world but i definitely wasn't as low as uh i thought i was or or people may have thought i was so i was kind of proving to myself in a sense, uh, that I, I really could do what I did. Yeah, absolutely. Nothing, nothing's better than that feeling of, you know, accomplishment, um, you know, in any aspect of life, whether that's sports, work life, uh, social life, anything like that. Um, so I, I know we touched on it earlier, um, and, you know, we're kind of going to continue to touch on it. Um, but what do you think the uh, biggest, um, or like what leadership skills have you, have you learned and developed 
through lacrosse, whether that be as a player, uh, you mentioned you were a captain, um, or, you know, as this, this creator? Um, I, I think I'm having trouble with the audio. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you fine. All right, because I think the AirPods just uh, turned off. I'll see if I can turn them on again. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yep, can still hear you. All right, all right. All right, I, don't, I cut off there in a little bit. I, I don't know what's going on, to be honest with you. Gotcha. No, I can, uh, so the, the, I can hear you fine. Okay, uh, so the best, or, or the thing that I, the leadership aspect that I learned, is that, was that, was that the question? Yeah, so like the leadership skills that you've developed, um, and, you know, whether that be as a player, captain, coach, uh, mentor, you know, anything. Okay. Um, there's a, I, I wear a lot of hats, so there's a lot of ways that, leadership my leadership personal leadership skills got developed number one like i said you got to learn that sometimes you're going to have to make hard decisions and be an asshole from an organizational point of view number two you can't have like emotions mixed in with business it's just like any other business this is an organization uh it might not make money but it's still a form of business right a non-profit so to speak um and um uh, you really have to be able to separate yourself emotionally from that, right? So you, you know, no hard feelings, but you're teaching the wrong way, for example, right? Like no hard feelings, but your practice is sucked. You got to make sure the kids throw like this and not like this, you know, or something like that. Uh, and uh, people are, uh, people have a difficult time doing that. And I, and, you know, I did too, you know, I take things personally sometimes that I shouldn't. And obviously that was one of the things that you learn over time that you don't, you know, don't, take things personally sometimes people are trying to help you out and the ones that aren't trying to help you out you know you take it with a grain of salt you don't know where they're coming from you don't know what kind of problems they have in their head but they're getting a point across to you so you should probably use that as feedback at some point you know the nice people the nicest people in the world aren't going to tell you what's aren't going to tell you your mistakes and what's wrong with you you know it's uh only your closest friends and your enemies are going to tell you what's wrong with you and those people are hard to talk to sometimes about that kind of stuff. Your friends might be okay, but you don't, might not have enough people that, uh, enough friends in your life that are, ready to, that are ready to bluntly talk to you. Uh, and your enemies, you probably don't want to talk to anyway. So it's tough to get good feedback sometimes like that. Uh, from, from a game point of view, you know, this is a thing that I learned going through my career. Sometimes you just got to give up the ball for the, for, the sake of growing the sport <laughs> that's one of the things i re that's one of the most difficult things for me to do sometimes because you know i'm shoot or shoot baby I'm, tr I'm trying to take that rip but uh i also understand that in a russian league it doesn't mean anything you know i sometimes you know i just like to compete whether it's basketball out in the playground outside my house i'm just trying to win i don't really care if there's a championship involved i'm just a competitive guy I like i like that kind of stuff there's no hard feelings I'm just trying to win because if, if we're taking it easy and just, you know, messing around, it's not really worth it to me because, you know, there's no, I get no satisfaction out of winning easily because somebody else gave up. I want to earn my win. Uh, so it's difficult for me to pass up the ball for the sake of uh, growing the sport. But what, what do I mean by that? So, for example, I do a one-on-one -on -one in the Russian league, right? We're playing a game. I take a one-on-one -on -one up top. I could take a shot every single time because i get open every single time in a russian league but what who other than helping me out with my shot and the goalie out with some experience how am i helping the game how am i helping my teammates are they learning anything by that uh no so sometimes you just gotta you know make your move and uh um if there's no championship involved sometimes you gotta put your competitive uh, self to the side and make that pass uh, so somebody can catch it, have their first goal, for example. We have that in the World Championship. You know, I could, there's a moment where I was going towards the goal, me and the goalie, but I also had an attackman to the left of me. You know, this is his first championship. He could have, you know, there's a bunch of times where, he, uh, where I passed him that same pass. He missed the, he didn't catch it or didn't put it in. And I decided, you know what, this is one of those moments. You got to give up the ball. We were winning uh, against the team and I, uh, we were winning by a couple goals, so I decided, you know what, we need, we need to pass that ball up. Even though in college, your coach would have yelled at you for, call, for passing that shot up. In this situation, sometimes you have to be more tactical from a development point of view. Um, leadership skills um, are very uh, – aren't they, they don't come – it's nothing that you could just learn just like that. They come from experiences, in my point of view. From my, maybe 
you know, people, other people are different. But from my experience uh, in life, they come from experiences that you have. So, for example, you know, I, I've played on a lot of teams, um, including uh, the Russian team whenever I was not um, in control of it, so to speak, was not organizing. We had some guys that in the middle of the 2014 Denver World Championship just left midway through <laughs> midway through the tournament three guys just left imagine that you got like a world championship and three guys <laughs> you know that's absurd to me you know uh another one of those guys called uh uh we, we were having a scrimmage with turkey the the day before or something or a couple of days before the championship started and one of the guys, and he, we, you know, we never met him before. He was just invited to play. He came from a D1 school, whatever. He called a Turkish guy a terrorist. You know, <laughs> he called a Turkish player a terrorist. Now, again, he's the first time on the team, but that reflects on us, right? So sometimes you gotta, you really have to take those experiences, and like next time you got a D1 guy, and we had this, we had this situation in 2018 too. You know, you think like, oh, man, you got to get this awesome guy. And, yeah, he might be pretty good, but he's an asshole. He doesn't pass the ball. He's playing for his own highlights. He doesn't care about you, your team, you know. So, and he'll drop your team to go play for another team because he has another passport or whatever. So, like, those kind of people you want to stay away from. You know, those, those are the people you want to guard your team from. Because, as you know, you, you have – one, if you have a chain of people, one link in the chain is weak or not with it, the whole thing breaks. It's difficult to have a good team when, uh, even if you watch that documentary in um, uh, the uh, Jordan documentary, Last Dance, when Pippen was, you know, you, you know, having his little hissy fit and he, he didn't want to go, uh, go in the game after they said, Ku coach can take a shot. You see what happened in that locker room afterwards? You know, Pippen was one of the most respected people all over the league. One little mistake out of the most respected and loved player, probably even on the team, to be honest with you, by everybody. Everybody loved Pippen. One little mistake in that locker room. We had grown men crying in the locker room, you know. So, and that, that happens in every sport. You, have, you, you can have one guy that makes one mistake. And, you know, Pippen was a good guy. They understand him and love him. But imagine a guy that nobody really likes – or, or, or nobody really knows and he acts like an asshole, what, the other team's not going to be nice to him and love him. They're going to react negatively. And that's going to put a damper on your whole team, your whole championship, and your chances to qualify for the next tournament. So there's a lot at stake in these tournaments. And sometimes you have to take these experiences that you learned in life and not just say like, oh, man, that was a shitty tournament. We'll try again next year. No, no, no. You got to sit down, learn why, why did this happen? What can we do? Well, how can we filter the process uh, or filter the players better? How can we fix the process so that we get the right type of mentality on our team, that we don't get a bunch of hot dogs trying to make their uh, highlight team or, or make their highlight for the college or, or whatever it is that they have in their head, you know, whatever goals they have in their, in their mind. And they're actually buying into the team uh, goals, the team atmosphere and the team uh, uh, culture, you know, without – without experiences you're going to get you're going to have an awful time in lacrosse but with experience if you have people that have experience that can guide you through you're going to have an incredible time uh so i guess you know in every aspect you always learn something and in, whether it's from an organizational point of view where you have to talk to everybody on the board find out what everybody's thinking listen to everybody it's not just you making the decisions you got to correct your decisions. you got to make sure you can look at yourself and look at uh, what you're doing and improve it or make some changes and it's difficult for a lot of people to do you know and that's or, to be honest that's why uh, you know we had a lot of uh, issues in Russia with people breaking off because they don't want to be they don't want to take responsibility for what they do right they they do something we say hey let's check you out they say no no we don't need you checking us out well, I'm not sure what you're doing then, you know, like if you just want to develop lacrosse in the sense like you're just putting a stick into a hand and then that's awful. The kids are just going to have a stick in their hand. They're going to know what lacrosse is, but never going to play in their life. Okay. That's one thing, but we want to kind of, we, we want to have the kids get a stick, be able to throw the ball, feel lacrosse, move forward, develop, go to the national team, blah, blah, blah. And you can't do that if you're not looking at your actions and not looking at your results and not looking at, your conversion rates and all that. It's like, like I said, it's a business. Conversion rates, amount of people, cost, uh, 
cost of acquisition. We have a cost of acquisition for each player. We even have, we, we got it down to that, right? So through all these experiences, through all these things, you, you know, if you're not doing this kind of stuff, you're not improving, you're going backwards. So it's a lot, but you know, it's, it's, um, 10 years of, uh, like I said, starting from five to seven people thrown around in a park to, to what we have now, there's a lot of experiences to learn from and a lot of things that we learn from. And that's why we make the decisions we make. And that's why we have to sometimes kick out people out of practices that we kick out because it's for the greater good and we have evidence to back it up. That's, uh, and, and along with that, no emotions after that, right? So it's all kind of mixed together in one thing. You got to take it, all these experiences, all these things, and just keep moving forward as, as best you can. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, uh, one more question that I had, um, and, and it's almost a personal question. What um, yeah. sort of inspires you the most uh, to do what you do? You know, what, what motivates you, what drives you? I know you mentioned earlier, you know, getting the, getting the sticks in the kids' hands and for the first time and, you know, giving them uh, an opportunity to, you know, play and, and possibly represent their country in a, in a sport that they probably hadn't even heard of. Um, you know, so um, is it that? Is it something else? Like what, what, what gave you this motivation and drive to, to do what you do? Uh, I love the game, man. Uh, I, get, I owe the game my life. I owe the game my life. Without the game, without la well, the game, I mean lacrosse, obviously. Without lacrosse, uh, I would have, yeah, I might have been in prison, to be honest with you. I might have been locked up. Uh, who knows where I would have been, to be honest with you. Uh, there's a lot of times, and not one time, a lot of times where the game has saved my life. So, uh, and this happened early and often, where I would see lacrosse has had a really positive in influence on my life. And I decided at an early age that if uh, if lacrosse saved my life, then I owe my life to lacrosse, uh, one way or another, or at least a lifetime. A lifetime in, in prison terms is 30 years. So uh, I think I still owe about like nine, nine years or so to the game before I could actually retire and call it quits and, you know, say that I uh, was effective or did something. Um, but that was, that's like an overall thing, like a general motivation. Uh, obviously, you know, life throws you in a lot of different ways and your motivations can change. You know, if you have a war going outside your window, you're not thinking about lacrosse. Um, but we're lucky enough that we're not in that situation. So the next thing I guess would be, you know, like I said, I, uh, in, in our other video, I, I like playing lacrosse. I want to travel the world and I want to make sure that, you know, I have a place to play and everybody else has a place to play that wants to play. And if everyone, anybody else wants to try it out, they can try it out. If you like it, we'll keep going. I want to make sure that there are consistent and stable facilities for people to, uh, be able to use in terms of lacrosse right and uh whether it's me or someone else or just learning from somebody uh uh because i like to see progress in people uh, i also teach english on the sides and it's kind of weird because uh, i like to see pro it, progress in people's english as well right so i like to see it uh when i'm teaching and i like to see it when i'm coaching like i like to see like a guy coming to practice every day and he's getting exponentially better than the guy that's coming two times a week, right? And I like to see that kind of thing. And then I like to see that same guy going to a tournament abroad. And then that same guy having success in that tournament. And then that same guy going to a championship and he having success there. After that, he finds out that there's a lot of other people in the world that love lacrosse and are cool just like him. And he meets a lot of people, he moves abroad or, or whatever. And I just see like the difference, you know how, you know, we talk about like a lot of different dimensions and, you know, which way your life can go based on the decision, butterfly effect, all that kind of stuff, right? Imagine, like, like I said, without lacrosse, who knows where I would have been. So I'm trying to give that back to people and change their lives to the better because there, I, haven't, I have never heard of lacrosse making someone's life worse. Uh, and I've only heard it making someone's life better uh, brighter, more colorful, uh, uh, obviously a healthier life. If you're playing any sport, obviously it's good for your health, right? So I want to see growth in people. I want to see progress. I want to pass on to people what was passed on to me, 
what was given to me. And obviously, I, like I said, I immigrated from Russia. I had an opportunity, uh, a once in a lifetime, once in a billion op- or you know whatever opportunity uh, to play lacrosse to, or to live in a different type of life. And I, d- I did relatively well. And I want to give that opportunity to kids out here in Russia. Russia, to be honest, and I don't know if you, you know, <laughs> know a lot about Russian history or the viewers know a lot about Russian history. Russians are pretty decent athletes. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of guys here walking around like gorillas that could just, you know, chop, <laughs> chop you in half with a long stick. Uh, but you know, they're, they're working as security or, or whatever it is, right. In some, some job, if they, if they would have known about lacrosse, they would have been playing, you know, they would have been tearing Paul Rabel up in the PLL, but because he doesn't know, he doesn't know what lacrosse is, you know, he might've played hockey for 15 years, you know, uh, stopped playing that sport because some minor injury or got married or whatever. And then that's it, right. Because there's nothing to move forward to. So there's a lot of these aspects that I see that in Russia, it's, there's a, a huge potential. And I want to give them what was given to me. If I could do that well, you know, I know this, the people in this country can do well. And we've proven it. You know, we've gotten to the point where the people I've taught and the people I've given opportunities to are now working against me. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, like I said, uh, and I think I said it in the previous, if you're, if you're not, if you don't have a, uh, if you don't have haters, or if you don't have people that are trying to destruct what you do or trying to put you down, you didn't. You're not successful yet. So you didn't do anything until you have people that are trying to actively put you down or talk trash on you or whatever or disrupt what you're doing. So it's uh, it's kind of like a bittersweet type of thing. So, um, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Well, um, with that, I'd just like to say thanks for coming on. I think it was an incredible interview. Um, you're a great guy to talk to. Um, was there anything that uh, you wanted to say before before I cut this off? Any questions, comments? Um, you know, I, I'm. I always want to. I always want to, like, send out like a like a genetic message, so to speak. Like, if you have Russian genetics, you you get this message automatically. You know, like if you have Russian genetics, you get like a message like you play lacrosse. Yes, no. If you click click yes hop on the national team or come visit Russia or whatever it is. Uh, I, I just want to get the word out because every year we have new, new, new kids every time. Uh, you know, I, I get a message from some 14 year old that got adopted or whatever, or uh, whatever it may be that he wants to be part of the national team, whatnot. He didn't even know that it was possible. We didn't know we existed. Uh, and I want, and, and a lot of people in the United States don't know about the international game at all. And uh, obviously, it's not NCAA, but it, it's not a bad level, and it's really, really fun. Uh, and it's really, from a culture, a cultural aspect, really incredible to play. You're going to different cities, different countries, different cultures, and you're playing lacrosse. So it's like something that you're very familiar to, in contrast with something you're not familiar with at all. Uh, and you know, I want to, I, I kind of want to, in general, introduce everybody, all the cross players in America to the international game, and more specifically, all Russian American lacrosse players, come back home, bring it on home, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> There's a home for you here, we'd love to have you. And I guess that would be the only thing I'd really want to uh, spread. If you, if the viewers know any Russian soul, any Russian guy, a guy with a Russian girlfriend or whatever, uh, send him my way. Uh, Google Russia lacrosse or Moscow lacrosse or whatever it may be, and uh, and we'll we'll hook you up. Awesome, awesome. I'm, I'm hoping people will get the message. <laughs> well, uh, with that, um, I'd just like to say thanks again um, for coming on. All right, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the time, and uh, I really wish you luck in the future with all your interviews and everything you do. And I hope to see you succeed. And uh, and I'm always ready to. Uh, come back and chat about anything uh so anytime you need to uh if you want to discuss something need some content or you know we'll bullshit about whatever you need <laughs> absolutely thanks again man have a good one yeah man. yeah see ya